This is the Content Marketing Podcast, episode number 45, Storytelling with Katherine Carr of Haiku Deck. Hello and welcome to the Content Marketing Podcast. This is the show where we help you attract and retain business through the power of quality content. I'm your host, Rachel Parker of Resonance Content Marketing, and today is November 14th, 2013. Hello, hello, and thank you for joining us today for episode number 45 of the Content Marketing Podcast. Just a reminder, we are live on iTunes and on Stitcher, so if you're listening to this episode on the blog, you can click on over and subscribe. That means you'll get new episodes automatically delivered to your computer or your smartphone or your tablet or your listening device of choice. And if you use a different app for your podcast listening pleasure, we also have an RSS feed, and I will provide that link to you in the blog post. In last week's podcast, we brought you a very special interview. Gary Vaynerchuk stopped by to chat about his latest book, Jab, 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 Right Hook, How to Tell Your Story in a Noisy Social World. If you happen to miss that episode, feel free to click on over to iTunes or to Stitcher or the RSS feed and get all caught up. And we also announced that we are giving away 20 copies of Gary's new book. To find out how you can win your very own copy of Jab, 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 Right hook, go to resonancecontent.com slash J-J-J-R-H. That's three J's and an R-H, as in jab, 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 a right hook. So that brings me to today's topic. Today we are talking about storytelling with Katherine Carr. She is the VP of Marketing and Chief Inspiration Officer of Haiku Deck. <music> Last month, I had the pleasure of attending Catherine Carr's presentation on storytelling at the AMA Marketing Edge conference here in Houston. And, you know, storytelling has in some ways become one of those flimsy, airy-fairy, uh, loosey-goosey buzzwords that a lot of people are throwing around these days, but don't really understand what it means and what it looks like. So I really enjoyed the way Catherine describes storytelling. She's got a very practical approach to it, and she also shared some fantastic examples. Now, at the same time, I've been planning to do an episode on storytelling for some time, so uh, it really kind of came together very nicely, and Catherine was kind enough to accept our invitation to come on the show and talk about it. For the past year, Catherine has guided the brand identity and built a passionate grassroots global community around Haiku Deck, a breakthrough presentation tool based on a visual storytelling. Her mission is to inspire entrepreneurs, marketers, thought leaders, educators, and creative communicators from all disciplines to set their story free with Haiku Deck. Hailed as the Instagram of Pitch Decks by Mashable and named App of the Year by GeekWire. Catherine first crossed paths with the Haiku Dex co-founder at Cranium, where she led content development and brand expression across a broad range of categories for most of the company's lifespan. At Cranium, Catherine discovered her passions for consumer focus, brand development, and word-of-mouth marketing. She led innovative brand strategy work at Hasbro and as an independent consultant before, fail, before falling for Haiku Deck over an iPhone demo at a karaoke party. I bet that's a story in itself. Catherine is pretty darn proud of her premier soccer-playing kids, her architect Iron Man husband, and her homemade bolognese. Got to get that recipe. Without further ado, here is our interview with Catherine Carr. Hey, Catherine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Rachel. So happy to have you here to talk about your story time. Um, but first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and about Haiku Day. Sure. So I am the Vice President of Marketing and Chief Inspiration Officer, which is really my favorite part of my title. Great. For, um, for a company called Haiku Deck, and we are a startup based in Seattle, and our mission is to make presentations simple, beautiful, and fun, mm-hmm. and to really revisit the way that people can tell their stories in presentations, which are an increasingly common way that we communicate, but not mm-hmm. often a very loved way that people okay. communicate. So we're trying to infuse that experience with a little more creativity and inspiration and, um, and positivity. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Well, uh, you and I met last month here in Houston at the Marketing Edge Conference, and you gave a great presentation on storytelling. And of course, it looked fantastic because it was done in Haiku Deck. <laughs> so, um, and I was thinking about that. It's almost like Haiku Deck is like is like the anti PowerPoint because in PowerPoint, it's like the data is the important part, and the visuals you just kind of slap in some some clip art or whatever. And it, but in Haiku Deck, the visuals are really center stage. Absolutely. And, you know, I think um, I try to be really tool agnostic and acknowledge that people can create lots of different um, great styles of presentations with different tools. But Haiku Deck really is built to keep the visuals as the main focus. Mm -hmm. And that's intentional because um, images just engage our attention Mm -hmm. and they can tell stories that really just don't come through with words. Mm -hmm. And I have found, um, since I started creating things with Haiku Deck, it really takes my level of communication to a different place and it makes me feel more creative and inspired. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's sort of a thought process that you have to go through. We're all used to kind of the typical PowerPoint way of communicating where you have your header and your three bullets. And like you said, you know, maybe a little stick on image or visual and and we just kind of get into that habit and um the thing about haiku deck is you have to really focus down to one key message on each Mm -hmm. slide which is a good practice Mm -hmm. i think for helping helping your story kind of bubble to the surface so i really enjoy the process Mm -hmm. and um and it the other thing is that a lot of times your slides look like they are professionally designed, but we actually make that part really easy. So for people who care about how their slides look, it's, it's a really fun, fast, powerful tool. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned that Haiku Deck is a startup. How did, how did the organization come about? Well, we have a funny backstory, which I shared at Marketing Edge. Mm-hmm. Um, the company actually started doing celebrity social gaming of all things. And... Um, you know, we had a big launch. At that time, I was working with them as a consultant, and we got a ton of press. We did this really fun partnership with um, Sir Mix-a-Lot, which people may remember from, uh-huh. from the 80s and 90s. And um, we got great press, but people didn't actually want to spend time playing the game. And so it really wasn't addressing a problem that people needed solving. And and so the founders kind of got to a place where they realized the engagement was really low and they tried to pivot and kind of take where they were and reinvent it. And so they did something around um, social video watching, which was also interesting, but again, it just didn't really t- uh, catch. And there was, I think, a small community of like avid Duran Duran fans who <laughs> loved it and had this like social video watching party that lasted for, you know, weeks. It just didn't really, um, it just didn't really grow and catch on. And in the process of pivoting yet another time, mm-hmm. the original founders left and he was the one who was really the artist and had always designed the slides mm-hmm. that were so beautiful and compelling and that got people's attention and that helped them land uh investment money mm-hmm. so they had to you know together a deck to share with their investors and it was just so beautiful right <laughs> you know they didn't have their artist and, they, you know, both of the founders had actually worked at Microsoft before, They're smart guys, and they, they just were struggling with this experience. And they had this moment of clarity that maybe that was the problem that really needed to be addressed because presentation software just, there really hadn't been a lot of innovation mm-hmm. in a couple of decades. And, and so, you know, one of them had this notion of building an iPad app that just really changed the experience and thought about it from a mobile first perspective. And it was a really radical departure from where they started. But the more they talked to people, the more they realized this was a pain point in people's lives. You know, PowerPoint has become almost a cultural joke, right? (laughs) Right. Thanks when those slides come up and it's like, Oh no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
people who create really great looking PowerPoints, of course, but, but in general, for most of us, it's not easy to create something that looks good and that inspires people to pay attention to your message. So, um, you know, that, that moment of clarity when they were really kind of running out of their runway is, was the inspiration for, um, you know, an app that is really turning into um, a pretty amazing global community. Mm -hmm. People try out this new way of communicating and are really responding to it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. When I I, I admit, I I walked into your presentation, I was a couple of minutes late. And when I walked in, the first words I heard were, sir, mix a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and I have to admit, I had baby got back running through my head through the entire rest of the afternoon. But but that's a great story. And and you know, I mean, storytelling is is such a big part of the Haiku Deck brand. And um, I was just on your website, and there's a big banner that says "Presentation Software to Set Your Story Free." So so how does how does what role does storytelling play? You, you talked about how it played in the part of high. It, played a part in the haiku decks origins but how is it how is it part of your culture going forward how does storytelling fit into to what you're doing what you're trying to do um sure so i think part of it you know we talked about the imagery and i think um i think images tap into a different level of communication and again they 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 sort of people sit up and pay attention and they're going to listen to what you're saying so and they connect on a really, a much deeper emotional level than, mm-hmm. for example, a wall of eight point text, <laughs> right? right? I know you can't read this, but. <laughs> yeah, right. And people say that, right? They do. Said it before. Uh-huh. <laughs> so um, I think, and, and then the other part of it is um, a, a pretty common behavior that, that people have developed as they give presentations. And again, I am guilty of all these things and I'm going to, I've done them in my past. I've created tons of presentations and given them. And, um, but we tend to sort of use the words on our slide, almost like a crutch and we read things off the slide. And that's pretty much the number one thing you can do that will turn your audience off. Yeah. They want to, sit there and listen to you read what they can read themselves. Mm -hmm. When you minimize the amount of text that you're displaying on the slide, um, you, you kind of, you have to get into a place where you're communicating in a more authentic way. And, and it takes practice. Sometimes, sometimes people don't feel comfortable with this right away, but over time, reading, to just be able to talk to your material, you know, talk to, to think about your message and what you want to say mm-hmm. and the story behind it and let that be, um, you know, that the, the center of your communication. And I think the other, the other thing that inspires us or that we're really trying to help people with is, um, it's pretty common for people to spend a lot of time on their presentation or their pitch. And it's really important, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you have an idea that you are trying to rally excitement around or, you know, a business you're trying to um, promote or a product that you're trying to get people excited about, it's very, it's, it's really, really important. And it should be like the most exciting and wonderful thing that we do, right? Mm-hmm. If we thing is to be able to tell that story. And too often, I think the tools that we use help, uh, encourage us to focus our time on the wrong things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Spend a ton of time fussing with things like uh, the order of your bullets or, you know, the, the transitions and the animations between things. And that stuff does take a lot of time. And sure, you can create some really cool effects, but I think it kind of shifts attention away from what your message really is. Mm-hmm. So we try to build this tool in a way that simplifies that experience of creating the presentation so that, you know, your time and your passion and your creativity can go into um, 
what that story really is, Mm -hmm. that thing is that you're trying to get people excited about or inspired by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And and part of your presentation, I I recall you were, you laid out the different types of stories that we can tell. And and I remember you shared some great examples. So can you go through pretty briefly what, what types of stories we're talking about? Sure. And, you know, I, I chose a few that um, I thought might be interesting to that audience. And I'm, I'm always collecting different examples. But um, the ones that I called out that we talked about specifically were um, your founding story. Mm-hmm. Which, which everybody has. Everybody has. And, um, and I think, you, you know, the, the example that I gave there was I, I told, I, you know, I sort of told about the background of Haiku Deck. Mm-hmm. In some ways, that's not a very strategic story, right? <laughs> it, it sort of makes us sound like we're wandering around trying to find inspiration. And it's not uncommon, actually. Mm-hmm, sure. A lot of businesses try different things before they land on the kernel that really sort of takes and you build around. So, um, but, you know, we could kind of try to downplay that story and say, oh, yeah, our founders used to work at Microsoft and they always had a vision for reinventing presentation software. And that might feel more strategic, but it's not really as authentic and it's really not that memorable either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, in the session um, at Marketing Edge, I talked about trying to make your stories real, resonant and repeatable. Mm-hmm. And I think your founding story is just a great opportunity to um, to really, I, I always like to try to hear it right from the founders or from people who are involved mm-hmm. at the very beginning and, and hear in their words, you know, what was that moment of clarity or that insight or that experience they wanted to change and, um, and to really capture that as authentically as possible, Mm -hmm. weave that into how you present your, your brand or your company. Mm -hmm. I I find that I've worked with a lot of companies as, you know, throughout my career, some as a consultant and some as an employee. And I I find that um, there's almost this uh, kind of a voice that a lot of companies take on when they're writing their about pa- about us page, and they all start to kind of sound the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I really value it when companies can be a little bit more true to their roots and just celebrate them, and you know, really tell it from the heart. Mm-hmm. And it really was, and you know, of course, you're always going to polish it up and uh, you know, make it make it uh, resonant and repeatable, but mm-hmm. that that realness matters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, And then a couple other types of stories that we talked about were um, data stories. And I I imagine you, you are cognizant of this as well, Rachel, but I just feel like there's so much talk in, in the field of marketing right now about your metrics Mm -hmm. and big data. data. (laughs) And, um, and it's great. We have so much data at our fingertips Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really important, obviously, to measure what you're doing and, and shape, shape your efforts around it. But I, I sort of come from the perspective, I really like to unpack the data. And I, I really believe that there, there are tons of stories behind the data that you're looking at. And I, I like to really try to go a little bit deeper and, um, and pull out you know, real examples and people, not hypothetical people profiles, but real people. <laughs> how, yeah. how are they using the product? What do they say about it? What do they love and what do they not love? Um, and so, you know, every, you know, if, if you're doing a survey and a thousand people take that survey, each of those people has a unique point of view and a unique experience. And um, I, I really spend a lot of time looking at the open-ended comments mm-hmm. to comment the, you know, the trends and the, this came in first or this came in second. I, mm-hmm. I really like to pull out exactly what they said and be inspired by that. I, I often get a lot of great insights and inspiration from those open-ended comments, the way that, the way that real people talk about their experience. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then we also covered customer stories and that that overlaps a little bit with what I was just talking about. But um, you know, I just feel like every customer story is a gift. And mm -hmm. as I'm as we're approaching building community around Haiku Deck, we spend a lot of time really shining the spotlight on what what people are creating with Haiku Deck mm -hmm. and, um, and celebrating that. And, and being inspired by that, discovering sort of new use cases that we hadn't thought of. And um, that's a really huge part of, um, of our marketing effort. So on my blog, uh, we have tons of guest Q&As or case studies. And, um, and it's almost, it's almost like I just really try to leave a lot of room for that type of story because mm -hmm. it's it really helps other people it helps give them an angle in mm -hmm. so um, I'm trying to think of some of the examples we talked about the um, the realtor John James did, mm -hmm. did I remember that that example but I um, I think one time I got a Google alert that we had been mentioned in publication that I, I, re I really didn't even have on my radar. It was, it's a publication that's specifically for realtors. Mm -hmm. And this realtor in Colorado had used Haiku Deck to land a $1.4 million listing. Wow. Written up in, in the news. And that was fantastic because realtors were, were not, it wasn't, it wasn't one of the communities that we were really focused on, right. but thought about it, it actually made a lot of sense. Like, you know, images are really important to how they do business and they're very mobile or, you know, they're carrying their iPads around in their car and, you know, giving their pitches and presentations in person. So it's actually a great fit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I tracked this guy down and called him up and we had a great conversation and I got these wonderful quotes that um, I use over and over again because his experience was so um, transformative. Mm -hmm. you know, I'd been trying to I had in my mind what I wanted to create and I'd been trying to do it for hours with PowerPoint and I finally just got frustrated and I tried Haiku Deck and, you know, it was so easy. I did it in just a few minutes. Like mm -hmm. it was, it was just really amazing. Mm -hmm. Anytime I'm talking to realtors, I always make sure to share that anecdote and point them to the case study. And over time I've collected um, dozens of mm -hmm. Examples. I, I, I use Pinterest in this way. I, mm -hmm. I actually, I sort of go at it from grouping different types of content so I can easily point somebody to examples that are relevant to them. Okay. So that's, that's really defined our whole strategy there. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, one thing that you, you talked about a few minutes ago, and I know it's part of your presentation, is um, telling the stories of your failures about things that didn't work out so well. And I know for traditional marketers that, I mean, they just break out in hives when you say that because we are so used to presenting this, you know, this polished, photoshopped, uh, sanitized versions of ourselves. But are you, are you seeing a shift to where people, I mean, like you said, all those About Us pages sound so much alike. Are you seeing a shift to where people people are looking for, for more of those real elements? I really feel like people value that mm -hmm. um, a lot and increasingly, and especially for a company like us. I mean, we're a startup, we're a challenger brand, mm -hmm. and an opportunity to differentiate ourselves from um, you know, a huge sort of corporate product or offering because we can be really personal mm -hmm. and be a little bit more, um, yeah, a little bit more forthcoming. So, you know, I mentioned this user experience survey that I just sent out to our whole community. And um, I didn't talk about this at my talk, but, you know, frankly, we're, we're, we've got a tiny team and we're always doing everything we can, but I did not set up the survey perfectly. I'm, I'm really, I'm really a fanatic about details, but <laughs> things that just weren't, you know, it, it didn't quite work the way I wanted it to. And I could see in the comments that people were a little bit like, yeah, the survey, you know, like I, you know, I couldn't click this and I, I was starting to hear that frustration mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you know, part of it is like, okay, I've definitely learned how to set it up correctly next time. But I also felt like it was really important to reach out and acknowledge 
um, that it wasn't really up to <laughs> my expectations. So I sent a special email to everybody who clicked through the survey and I just thanked them for taking the survey. And I said, you know, a couple things didn't work exactly how we wanted. And if you felt frustrated, I'm really sorry about that. But thank you so much for your insights. And we really, you know, I read all your comments. I actually offered them uh, the opportunity to unlock a premium theme in the app. Mm -hmm. I got some, so many great responses just to that mail where people said, oh, thank you so much. You guys are so great. Like, it really goes a long way toward building um, goodwill and reminding our community that we're people too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just an entity. Like, we are people who care about what we're doing. And, you know, we put a lot of heart into our work and sometimes we do make mistakes and I think it's absolutely fine to acknowledge those and it's an, an opportunity to kind of re-engage and rebuild that goodwill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another thing I, I'm, I'm noticing myself, Catherine, is that kind of out there in the, the more, um, you know, let, uh, let's call them the marketing intelligentsia, the, the idea of storytelling has almost become a buzzword. And I hear people like using it ways like, we're going to tell the story about how our product can solve all your problems. And I have to say, that's not a story, that's an ad. So um, do you find, um, do you find we still have some, some a ways to go before people really understand what storytelling is um, in its, in its purest form and why it's important? You know, I, I think you were right on that there, that, that word is being used in a lot of different ways. And um, this is why I talked about the importance of real stories, mm -hmm. especially in marketing, you know, you're sort of always fighting against the suspicion that you're trying to pull a fast one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, as, and when you, when you're sort of, focusing on that once upon a time, that kind of magical story that definitely has a place in our culture and, and, you know, I'm sure has inspired some great advertising and creative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a really rich and fascinating topic. Um, the type of marketing that I practice and that I believe in is really grounded in, in real stories and real anecdotes. And I, I find that it's so much more powerful um, for, for example, for a teacher to hear examples and case studies of how other teachers are using haiku deck in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Me telling them, <laughs> you know, it's great for visual storytelling or it's great for vocabulary. But when it, when I am actually showcasing, look at this fourth grade teacher from Texas. Look what she did. It's incredible. It has a um, it has just a much greater impact, mm -hmm. a level of believability that um, that really does resonate and makes makes people sort of pay attention to what you're doing and really inspires that true word of mouth marketing that mm -hmm. is the most valuable and the most effective and the, and the trickiest I think if you're <laughs> if you're investing a lot in trying to create, um, you know, those sort of once upon a time magical <laughs> stories, mm -hmm. I mean... Yep, absolutely. Um, it, it's funny when I was when I was preparing for this interview, I went to your bio on the on the marketing edge page, and it said, "Go click through to Catherine's bio." And your bio is a haiku deck, which I thought was fantastic. It is. <laughs> And, um, you know, we usually think of, okay, you know, there's, there's capital, capital P professional over here and there's capital P personal over here. And the professional is the data and the personal is all the, the soft stuff. And I, I, the, what I love about your, your bio is that you combine the two. So you have charts on your favorite things and places you've lived. Um, yeah, because, you know, if we all wrote purely professional bios, we'd all sound the same. So mm -hmm. I'm taking a little creative liberty and that's me, you know, like mm -hmm. that is who I am. If you look at my Twitter bio, you'll see that I'm a brand geek <laughs> um, and I make a mean homemade bolognese and mm -hmm. that's really who I am. Um, so, you know, I try to give a sense of what my professional background is, mm -hmm. but, but also kind of what makes me tick and care about and through that also communicate passion. Mm -hmm 
Steve, and, and hopefully give a really like, you know, show an interesting way that haiku deck can be used. I had so much fun putting that together. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of fun reading it. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> She spent she spent thirty eight percent of her life in in, you know, in this in this location. And I'm being you know again I'm being real there yeah. and that yeah I do I, I sure wish I'd spent a lot more time working on books and blogs than I actually do but mm-hmm. so I'm I'm being human there but also I hope giving a sense that um, these are all the components that make up me and and make up my approach to my work mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Because I think, you know, again, writing your writing your bio, isn't that often, uh, another thing that sometimes just makes your heart sink? Like, oh, <laughs> yes. So why shouldn't it be fun? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and something that you mentioned a few minutes ago, we usually think of presentations as a marketing thing. But you mentioned that a lot of teachers are having just tremendous success using Haiku Deck in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's, I mean, it's what's really fascinating and also challenging about my work is I think I shared this data point at the, in the talk, but you know, I could say I have 800,000 people who have downloaded Haiku deck, um, which is a number mm-hmm. <laughs> not remember, but the other interesting thing about it is it's a passionate global community and I have everybody from first graders using it to showcase their artwork. Wow to the, the chief technology officer of Australia, who's wow. used it, his vision for that company's infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So incredibly broad um, group. And you know, I don't have, oh, this is our target customer. That a lot of, you know, a lot of marketing is driven by that sort of imaginary mm-hmm. <laughs> that you develop or sometimes multiple personas. So, you know, I do have, we do have a lot of breadth and it's really it's really been amazing to see how creative and um, and enthusiastic teachers and students have been in using Haiku Deck. And again, that wasn't one of the audiences we were initially working hard to reach, but they they sort of took to it and have been incredibly powerful for spreading the word mm-hmm. and um, driving that word of mouth. So um, it's it's a community that I really value yeah. and have really loved sort of getting to know and understand, you know, what what their needs are and why they why they gravitate to it. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of your community, um, one thing that I love about Haiku Deck is it's not only uh, a a creation platform; it's also a sharing platform. So you have, you know, you have all those haiku decks, and you have your featured deck of the week, and and people can just go through and say, "Oh wow, look at what this person! Oh, look at how they use that!" And I think I think that for me, that's really where it started to click of how how powerful this app is. Well, that's you know that's another way that we try to help people set their story free. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you're investing time into creating something, a presentation, and and I recognize that you know some presentations are meant to be private and they have proprietary information. I'm not going to set my board update haiku tech, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but a lot of times, you know, we just have messages that we want to get out there, and um, and it's a really fun way of creating some content that's a visual. Mm-hmm. Um, I think pretty consistently recognized as driving higher engagement across different channels that when you include some sort of visual and, you know, you can easily embed them in your blog. You can post them to different social sites and it's sort of fun to put them out there and yeah. just, Sometimes I'm really surprised. There'll be ones that I created months ago that I haven't even looked at in a while and mm-hmm. realized that they've gotten, you know, several thousand views. Right. Like, you know, so, so um, I think it's been, it's been really neat to see, um, you know, people with some, some expertise they want to share. I've seen a lot of great, uh, you know, 10 tips for doing X or Y. I've seen, I've seen a haiku deck of that illustrates how to, um, how to slice a pomegranate and how to like take this <laughs> really great. Um, so people sort of sharing their insights or their expertise, or also just, um, 
just sharing, you know, I, I spent, I did spend some time creating that, that haiku deck for the marketing edge talk. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed being there in the room, but I also want some of those ideas to spread beyond the room. So I posted it online with some brief notes that recap kind of what I was talking about. And, um, it's a way I think of helping amplify your message and taking things online mm -hmm. that that's easy for people to share and engage with. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, tool. absolutely. Um, you know, one thing uh, going back to marketing edge, one thing that came up in the Q and a session, and I thought the answer was, was fascinating is how did the name haiku deck come about? Yeah. So, um, that's a question we get asked a lot. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes people are, you know, they're flummoxed. They'll download the app and they're like, wait, I thought I was going to write haiku. And it's like, <laughs> if you want to. But really the, the, the idea is that um, as a poetic form, the haiku offers constraints and rules that you have to operate within. But at the same time, within those rules and those constraints, it unlocks creativity and poetic expression. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, anyone who tries out Haiku Deck, you'll notice that it does limit the amount of text you can put on a slide, mm -hmm. which is by design for the reasons we talked about earlier. Um, and, and, you know, we, those influences kind of carry through. One of the themes is named 575 after the, the, uh -huh. the rhythm of a haiku. And we've, act, we've had, I've collected, you know, some people make Haiku Decks that are actually haikus. <laughs> But um, just, I mean, the basic idea is just constraints unlock creativity. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's a really, I, I didn't name the brand. I, I got involved after that was decided, but mm -hmm. I actually really think it's a, a perfect name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That idea of simplicity and, um, and visual poetry. I think haikus often have that evocative imagery that's core. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. To what so, so Haiku Deck, it is currently available as an app, and do I understand that you're working on an on an online version? Yes. Okay. We are the the um, the app. It's a free iPad app that you can download from iTunes, and um, and we are really close to launching our web web version right now. Um, it's in private beta right now, and if you go to the website, which is just haikudeck.com, and you click the big Get Haiku Deck button, it directs you to either get it for your iPad or request an invite to the private beta, mm -hmm. which yeah, it's, it's really close. Mm -hmm. We're excited about allowing even more people to set their story free. I love using it on my iPad, but um, we definitely heard loud and clear from and from people who are interested but just don't have an iPad. Mm -hmm. that... Yeah, awesome. So if people go to Haiku Deck, they can not only download the app, but they can see all the all the various Haiku Decks in your community. Yeah, and, you know, I invest, um, I, we invest a lot of time into curating that gallery that you mentioned. And um, we really try to show a wide variety of use cases from different disciplines um, you know, we show different examples and, um, I think that's really important for people again, to, to get inspiration and get ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, we also, I mentioned Pinterest and I, um, I, we have probably 80 different boards that show again, different types of haiku deck. So if you're interested in using it on your blog or interested in using it for real estate or education or entrepreneurship there there are lots of different ones to look at there as well uh, because it is it is a new it's kind of a new paradigm and um, I find so much inspiration from our own community we just want to share that make it visible mm -hmm. great so obviously you're you're hard at work on that on that web app anything else up in the future for for haiku deck for you guys um yeah, our web app is really our our high priority, but we are always um, we are always looking to push the experience a little bit farther than people expect. So, 
as we consider improvements to the app, we are definitely, um, we do really listen to what our current users are asking for, but we're also trying to spend some time thinking on um, things that just take the experience even farther beyond our, our expectations. So there are some really cool, exciting things coming up as well, which I can't quite share yet. But Okay. But there is a blog on the website, so if we keep up with that, that will have the latest and greatest. Yeah, and there I'm really trying to share, um, again, case studies, mm -hmm. user stories, which I feel is so important, um, and also just tips that people can use to give, give better presentations and communicate better. So, um, you know, that, that whole, that's been a really crucial part of our content marketing. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's great. And um, obviously this information is available on uh, at haikudeck.com, and you guys are also out there on, on social media. Absolutely. Yep. Write to us. We'll write back. Okay. And I have to say, yours is the one Twitter handle that I never have to look up because it's Mama Twita, and it just sticks in my head. <laughs> Whenever I think Catherine, I know exactly where to find you. The people in the office actually often call me Mama Twita. Do they? <laughs> That one's stuck. It's one of those, sometimes I wish I had just done my actual name, you, <laughs> but it's memorable. So. Uh, yeah, Funny. There you go. Well, thank you again, Catherine. Appreciate it. Pleasure. All, All right. right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Many thanks again to Catherine Carr for joining us today to talk about storytelling. Hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Again, that ha that website is haikudeck.com. That's H-A-I-K-U-D-E-C-K.com. And just to repeat, for now, it is available only as an iPad app, but they are currently working on a browser-based application that you'll be able to access through your, through your computer. And uh, if Catherine's word holds true, they've got lots of other plans for the future. So if you're not an iPad user, go ahead and connect with them and see about maybe getting in on the private beta they have going on and uh, keep up with what is happening at Haiku Deck. Hi, Hermione. I got beagle lip licks. Okay, um, now it's time for our content marketing tip of the week. For today's tip, I want to talk about surprise storytelling. And the tip I want to give is look at the content, look at what you are trying to communicate, and see if you have an opportunity to weave a story into that communication. It's going to make your message much more powerful and much more memorable. And just to give you an example, part of my... <clears throat> Part of my presentation, Driving Business in a Post-Madman World, is I talk about how difficult it was in the pre-internet days to find objective information about products and services. You just were not able to, you know, go to a website or, or find objective information anywhere. And what I could do is I could just state that, you know, before the internet, it was very difficult to get product and service information that was unbiased or it was very rare or very difficult to find. But instead, I tell a story. And the story goes something like this. See, I already have your attention. Back when I was in college, uh, budding queen of the nerds that I was, I worked at the public library. And part of my job was to maintain the periodicals. So all the magazines, the newspapers that came into the library, part of my job was to rotate uh, new issues in and rotate old issues out and make sure that the shelves were very nicely maintained. And here's the thing. There was one publication at that time that we could not trust the public with. We could not put it on the shelves because it would walk away immediately. Um, and in order to read this publication, you had to go to the circulation desk. We would hang on to your driver's license while you read this publication, and then you would get your license back when you returned the issue to us after you had finished with it. Now, can you guess what publication that was? Any guesses? It was Consumer Reports, because in the days before the Internet, Consumer Reports was like gold. It was one of the few sources that we had of truly objective information about products and services. 
In fact, I remember the car issue would come out every April, and by June, that thing would be in shreds because so many people had checked it out to look at it. So that kind of makes the point that I'm that I'm talking about about the um, about how the internet really changed the availability of objective information about products and services. Now, tell me, would you rather hear the story, or would you rather me hear hear me talk about how different it was back then and how the internet changed anything? And changed everything, excuse me. Um, the story makes it much more compelling. It paints a picture. It puts people in the picture. You can picture me. Um, and I actually took a fun photo of myself against a green screen and uh, photoshopped a library background. And I'm wearing a hoodie like I'm in college with a stack of books in my arms. So I really made it kind of fun. But it really, the story itself paints a picture and it puts people in the picture. And you can picture people handing over their driver's licenses and get, getting their greedy little paws on the um, on the consumer reports. And you can do that with almost any piece of information, whether it's data you're trying to communicate, whether it's um, regardless of what it is. And the story, here's, here's one thing that I, I learned that really kind of, kind of liberated my thinking. The story doesn't have to be yours. It can be, um, it can be a story from business. It can be a story from history. It could even be like a fable or a fairy tale. If it helps illustrate your point, um, it's going to make that message much more powerful because people are hardwired, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we are hardwired to listen to and to appreciate stories. So any opportunity you get to weave a story into your communication, it is going to be well worth your time because it's going to make your message that much more powerful and that much more memorable. Okay, campers, that is it for me this week. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Content Marketing Podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please feel free to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or via our RSS feed. And if you really like what you've heard, please leave us a quick review on iTunes. I would so appreciate it. For more information about content marketing, you're welcome to visit our blog at resonancecontent.com slash blog, where you'll also find links to our pages on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and other social networks. If you'd like to email me a question to cover in our tip of the week, you can contact me anytime at rachel at resonancecontent.com. And if you'd like me to come speak about content marketing to your business or your organization, you can find information about my most current talk at contentmarketingspeaker.net. As a final note, don't forget we are giving away 20 copies of Gary Vaynerchuk's latest book, Jab, 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 Right Hook. And to enter to win, just go to resonancecontent.com slash jj. J-J-R-H. As always, I le- like to leave you with a quote, and today's is from Brian Eisenberg. He says, effective content marketing is about mastering the art of storytelling. Facts tell, but stories sell. Again, this is Rachel Parker with Resonance Content Marketing, and we will see you again next week. Take care. Take care.